Pastor Smith is going to be here. Yep. So he's going to fill in for me. Yep. I think we will. So it won't be as warm as, as Florida, but it'll still be fun. So it won't be as humid. That's never bothered me. So, yeah. What's that? I think they say like the low 70s. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are we going to have around here? You know, 55, 50s? I don't know. I'm in 40s. Okay. So it'll be warmer down there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's the signal. While we're waiting to go live, um, one of the members said after the service, you know, maybe the way to get back at those rattlesnakes is to eat one because she said her husband ate a rattlesnake when they were in Arizona. <laughs> Has anybody else had rattlesnake? It's supposed to be good? Like chicken? <laughs> Okay, everybody, let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, in a day and age when so many in our culture are confused about love, uh, we thank you for giving us the greatest example of love. God so loved the world that he gave. And thank you for giving us people like Ruth and Boaz and uh, Naomi to demonstrate to us again how love for God shows itself in love in our lives. Uh, bless our study of these two people as we uh, turn to you for guidance in our marriages and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so we begin with Ruth and Boaz. This is the first lesson on them. And uh, boy, here's a question or uh, an assignment for you. Define love. What is love? Um, and I, like I said in the prayer, I, I think our world is very confused about love. We say things like, I love chocolate. But we also say things like, I love my wife. And, uh, you know, chocolate doesn't do for me what my wife does for me. Um, and, and I don't do for chocolate what I do for my wife. So uh, we are very confused about that word, love. Um, in Webster's Dictionary, I looked this up this morning, there are 16 different entries for the word love. Maybe that tells you something. Um, how, how would you define love in the simplest, basic ways? Maybe there's more than one definition. How would you define love? Anybody want to start? Meg. Okay, that's a good way to start. Um, love is, she said, strong feelings for someone. So love involves the emotions, the feelings, right? Um, what else? Anybody? Uh, go ahead, Sue. Unselfish giving. Unselfish giving is what she said. Um, maybe part of the problem is that uh, in English we... we I guess you could say have one word for love in Greek. They have more than one word for love. And, and uh, the word for love that Sue was maybe getting at was this word in Greek called agapao is the verb or agape. Did, have you heard that term before? Agape or agapao? What does that mean? And it means just what you said, unselfish love, sacrificial love, love that puts others ahead of yourself, okay? Um, see, now I wouldn't love chocolate that way, uh, but I would love my spouse that way um, and strive to serve my Savior that way, too. So, okay, so it's both a feeling and, uh, what you put it, an attitude? Uh, an attitude, perhaps, of putting someone else ahead of your, of your own self? If it's a feeling and an attitude, maybe there's one more thing we could add to that. Meg? Love is an action, right? 
Love is, is, is not merely a feeling, but love is an action, um, a self-sacrificing action, a, a, a determination to put others ahead of yourself and consider their needs ahead of your own, an intentionalizing of that. That is love. Okay? And, and hopefully, we're going to see all of that as we study these, this couple, Ruth and Boaz, uh, today. So we're going to read the first five verses of Ruth chapter 1. You can follow along. And then we'll have some context questions at the bottom of the page. So it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. And if you're looking at the map, you can see where all these places are. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons, and they married Moabite women, one named Orpah, and the other named Ruth. But by the way, is it true that Oprah Winfrey's name was supposed to be Orpah, and they got it wrong on the back, the certificate, birth certificate? I think I've heard that before. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Orpah and Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years in Moab, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Uh, boy, can you imagine that? So it doesn't sound like in the space of a very long time she lost her husband and her two sons. And so basically what? She lost her, uh, back in that time in that culture, her ability to what? Survive, take care of herself. Yeah, uh, that was gone. No sons, no husband. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about the context. When is this taking place? From that very first verse, you get the context. This was the, during the time of the judges, is, is what Don said. When was the time of the judges? So after Moses had led the people out of uh, their slavery in Egypt, and they came to the, con to the promised land, and under the leadership of, con of uh, Joshua, conquered that land, took that land for themselves. Um, so after that time, but before there were any kings in Israel, so before David's time. So in that period of, of you know, some 400 years or so, 500 years, that's when this takes place between the, the time of the exodus uh, and the conquering of the promised land and the time of the kings, starting with Saul and then David. So in that period, in the time of the judges, um, where... Well, you, you see that there in uh, verse 2, is it? These guys were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And I don't know if this is an oversimplification, if you're trying to figure that stuff out, what's the relationship between all that. Maybe it's the same kind of city, county, state thing that we have, something similar to that. Um, from Ephratha, or Ephrathai, Ephratha maybe, uh, from Bethlehem and then from Judah. Okay, um, who does it involve? It involves Elimelech and his wife, Naomi. Their two sons, Malan, Kilian. Um, and then eventually, the two sons' wives, uh, Orpah, Orpah and Ruth. So that's who's involved with this story. And then later on, Boaz enters the picture. And what? Well, it was a time of famine. And you can see there from the map that they moved. Uh, they crossed the Jordan River. They went down to this area back then known as Moab and stayed there for a while. And then when um, the, the sons died, the husbands died, the husband died, then they decided to move back to Bethlehem. Whereas Naomi decided to go back. Okay. Um, let's pick up the story on the next page. Well, 
When she, that's Naomi, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there, back to Bethlehem. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and they said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? That's kind of ridiculous. Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then give birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you. That word bitter comes up a little bit later. It's more bitter for me than for you, uh, because I'm old, that's her thought, right? I, I don't have a chance to remarry, uh, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Boy, those are some strong words. We'll look at that. At this, they, the daughters, or daughter-in-laws, wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. And here's these famous words. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And I said they were kind of famous words. In what context are they well known? Maybe weddings. Um, you sometimes hear these words read at a wedding. And, and you can see how they would be fitting for something that a husband and wife would say to each other. But here they're actually spoken between daughter-in-law to mother-in-law. Okay. Uh, going on. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. So that last sentence was an oath, the ancient form of an oath. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, which means what? bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Yeah, some of you remember that we had a one-year fill-in teacher here at Mount Olive, a really nice young lady whose name was Mara. I've always wondered, and her dad was a pastor, I always wondered if there was something that, uh, uh, some, something behind the scenes going on there. She was anything but bitter, if you remember her. Nice young lady. Call me Mara. Uh, then the next verse. I went away full. Uh, I left Bethlehem full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth, the Moabitess, sure that we know that she's a Moabitess, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Okay, so here's the first or the second question. Naomi insisted that she be called Mara, which is a Hebrew word meaning bitter. Note in verses 20 and 21 how Naomi certainly seems to blame God for what had happened to her. Doesn't he? Doesn't she? I went away full, uh, but the Lord has brought me back empty. The Lord has made my life very bitter. 
the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. That certainly seems to, to blame God for her misfortune. Uh, so the question says, this is a good time to answer this question. Why do bad things happen to people? And, and we'll be specific about, uh, you know, assuming that Naomi is a child of God, a believer in the true God and his promises. Why do bad things, which, you know, the world would say is bad, the society would say is bad. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Dan, you have the, the, the question that has been plaguing theologians for thousands of years. Why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> it's true. When we said good people, I wonder if anyone is good. Well, you're certainly right. He said, uh, does the Bible really call anybody good? In fact, the Bible says there is no one who does good, not even one. Okay, I'll, I'll toss that word good people away. How about why do bad things happen to Christians or believers? You want to put it that way. Meg? She said to show God's glory and as some kind of benefit to them, uh, spiritual benefit to them, uh, strengthening of faith, for example. Now, why would you say that first one, to show God's glory? Well, um, I'm thinking of the story of the blind man and the disciples asked Jesus what he did and why did, why did he treat this man now blind? Yeah, when uh, they came across this blind man and and uh, the disciples foolishly asked Jesus, or maybe not so foolishly, who said that this man is blind? Was it his parents that they did something wrong, or was it this man himself that he was born blind? And Meg, Jesus' answer was, this was shown to... That God may be glorified. Right. God may be glorified. That God may be glorified. Tim, you had another answer? So suffering is just part and parcel of living in a sinful world. Um, it, 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 it may be tied to our own actions. It may have nothing to do with our own actions. It may be tied to the fact that we are Christians. It may have nothing to do with the fact that we are Christians. But just the, the fact that we're living in a world that has been ruined by sin, there is going to be pain and suffering. Maybe I'd like to bring it around to, to refute this idea that um, God receives some kind of perverse pleasure for, in our suffering. Um, that, that God is responsible for that kind of thing happening. Does God punish us for the wrong things we do? That's kind of a loaded question. Uh, we know that he has punished all of our sins, past, present, and future, in Christ Jesus. That we know. We also know that God cannot sin. Okay? So that he doesn't do things out of spite uh, or uh, because he gets some kind of perverse pleasure in seeing us suffer. Um, God doesn't do that. And, and, and one of the passages that you know so well, um, maybe two of the passages you know so well, we're, we're coming up to one of them in our Joseph Bible study at the end of the book of Genesis where um, Father Jacob is dead and gone. It's just Joseph and his brothers. And now the brothers are worried that Joseph, now that dad is gone, is going to take revenge. And Joseph says what? Does anybody remember? You can paraphrase it. Anybody remember? Uh, oh, go ahead, Randy. Right. You intended to harm me, like you said. But God took those evil actions. 
and made them turn out for good, uh, for the saving of many lives, something like that. Um, and, and you know the, do you, do you, before I get to you, Carrie, do you know the, the New Testament corresponding verse to that one? All things work together for the good of those who love him. So in other words, when there are bad things like these, this happening in our lives, God has a plan for them to work out for our good. A plan that we may be aware of, a plan that we may not be aware of, but that is his promise. Carrie? And that was where I was going to go, is that through my years of working with families and, and hurt and disappointment, when we put those things at the cross, he really does use your hurt and your disappointment to help others see healing and comfort. Right. So, So in other words, when, when we go through suffering or affliction, we are better able to help, um, comfort, um, advise, whatever, the people who may be going through similar things. To his glory. Yep, to his glory. We can get lost in making it about us. It's all about me. Right. I got all the answers for you. Don't right. worry. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and I, I also want to back up to, to what Meg said. Maybe that's what, that fits along with what you said. For some kind of spiritual benefit, right? Uh, for the strengthening of faith. Uh, for the purifying of faith and so on. Okay, uh, let's go to number three. Orpah left Naomi, Ruth stayed. In verse 22, the author refers to uh, Ruth as a Moabitess. This matters. Read the passage below and discuss why Ruth's Moabite heritage might have made it difficult for her to live among the Israelites. So why was this kind of a a really um, sacrificial thing for her as a Moabite woman to live among the Israelites, okay? So this is Numbers chapter 25. Uh, it takes place, you know, not long after our sermon text for today took place. And um, it, the, the people of Israel have not crossed the Jordan River into the land of Canaan yet. They're still on the, the far side of the Jordan. But this is what it says. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men, the Israelite men, began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifice of their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. Now, I'm, talk, I'm thinking he's talking about the Moabite people plus these Israelite men who went over and joined them. So Israel joined in worship, worshiping the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people. I think he's talking about his people. Kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your men who have joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. And then this interesting couple of verses. Is this guy that we're going to read about just so foolish or such an idiot or so bold or what? But here. Then an Israelite man uh, brought to his family a Midianite woman. The Midianites and Moabites were working together now. Uh, right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So it looks like uh, Moses and some of the people anyway are are feeling repentant, and what does this guy do? He brings a, a, a Moabite woman or Midianite woman right into his tent with him, with his family. Uh, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and followed that Israelite into his tent. He drove the spear through both of them, through the Israelite and into the woman's body. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped. Okay? Because of the offense was gone, I guess. But, but nevertheless, those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. So you see that, uh, that little box there on the right-hand side, Ruth's heritage problem. What was her heritage? What was her heritage problem? Her, her, well, 
in, in the history of her people, the Moabites, they had seduced the Israelites and that ultimately led to the death of how many? 24,000 people. And now, uh, uh, Ruth is deciding to go live among the Israelites who may still be holding a grudge for 24,000 deaths years earlier. Uh, that might have been a, a challenging thing for her to, to uh, uh, you know, she didn't know how she was going to be received among the Israelites. Are they still going to hold a grudge for what had happened years earlier? Um, and to say nothing of the fact that she's going into a new culture, a, a new area, uh, maybe a new language, I don't know, or, or whatever. But uh, it's going to be all different for her. Um, uh, Dan. Could we say if you weren't a Jew, you could not become a Jew? Uh, he said if you weren't a Jew, could, is it possible that you could become a Jew? Okay? I, I know, and, and I'm going to look for some other people who know more about this than me. But at least I know in New Testament times, there were converts to Judaism. Um, in Old Testament times, were, were there converts to Judaism? Randy? I think in the law, Moses, there were stipulations where if a foreigner comes and wants to worship God, and this is the way, so I, I think that was something. Then, then you accept him as an Israelite, right? But, and, and does he have to be a certain size, perhaps, and uh, all that kind of stuff, too? Yeah, yeah and I don't know that he's accepted as an Israelite, but he's accepted as a... As a believer. <laughs> Okay, uh, Tim? I think there's a few different accounts. Like there's the general from the Syrian army. Naaman? Naaman. Yeah. He mentions he comes back to worship. Right. So, yeah, so uh, anecdotally, we know that there were people who, uh, the, um, those kings that, uh, those kings of uh, um, uh, Babylon, Babylon and Persia that, um, you know, for a while at least seemed to, to hold to the true God. Uh, yeah. Yes, Rahab obviously was one too. Yep. So, yeah, there are examples of that. Of that, and and, and, and I'll have to do some more exploring. That where there was something in the the law of Moses that allowed for that. So. Okay. Uh, whose question was that? Dan. Dan's question. Yeah. Uh, so um, yes, I suppose there was a path to acceptance. Uh, but, but you know very well that sometimes people hold on to grudges a long time. Right? So who knows how easy it would have been for her. Okay, um, despite her Moabite heritage, Ruth stayed with Naomi. Why? Reread verses 16 and 17 on the other page. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with thee, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Okay, so the question is, pick which word describes Ruth's reaction to her mother-in-law's bitter situation. What, what, what words and why Describe Ruth's reaction to Naomi's bitter situation. Fear, pity, love, faith, all of them, some of them, in what aspects, in what way? Meg, you got an answer? C and D. Certainly, you know, you get the impression from uh, verses 16 and 17 that she is expressing love for her mother-in-law, right? Um, and it's, and it's, and it's, it is an unselfish, um, self-sacrificing love. I'm, I'm going to put my needs in the back seat, and I'm going to, I'm going to go with you, because, because, well, I suppose there, and maybe, maybe Meg, you could make the case that there's fear there too, because that maybe she's thinking. How is, how is Naomi going to take care of herself? And maybe the two of us together can somehow figure out a way. So maybe there was that. But certainly she's expressing love 
And, and why do you say letter D, too? Yeah, your God will be my God. Yep. Um, I, and I don't think, obviously, that this is the first instance of, of Ruth being exposed to Naomi's God, or the God of Elimelech, or the God of, of uh, Malan and Killian, that um, as, as Jewish faithful people, they were expressing their faith in that God and the promises of that God. And so over the course of time, she had gotten to know that God. And so this isn't, this. I don't think this is a spur of the moment, I'm going to chuck my God and take your God thing. Uh, but it certainly is an expression of her faith in that one true God. Uh, Dan first and then Randy. Where would we fit in a word like allegiance? Or does it belong in that? Allegiance? Sure. I, That's I, what I would, where I would put it. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, okay, allegiance to uh, Naomi's God or allegiance to Naomi? To Naomi, sure. Um, yep, um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna dedicate myself to helping you, to being with you, Randy. I'm just, I'm just thinking that Naomi really comes out not looking very good in this thing at all. She doesn't, does she? Like that, there'd be no spiritual harm done with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, there, you know, uh, she does not show up in uh, the Hebrews chapter 11, Heroes of Faith chapter. <laughs> and maybe she doesn't uh, deserve a spot there. But uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, the, the way that she describes her bitterness, boy, I guess I'm going to give her somewhat of a pass because I've never been there. I've never lost children or a spouse. Uh, nevertheless, it's, that's really strong language, isn't it? Um, and then to sort of nonchalantly say to her daughter-in-laws who have been exposed to the true God, yeah, just go back to your gods. That doesn't seem like she's really concerned. Okay. Um, well, uh, good thing that Ruth is with her, then, uh, because Ruth demonstrates more of a Christ-like character than, than Naomi does and, and can use that around uh, Naomi and benefit Naomi, too. Okay, um, you know, I think we're going to stop there because this is kind of a, a logical stopping point and we wanted to end early so we can get our uh, part of our coordinating council meeting in. Uh, before the baptism, and a lot of things hanging together this morning after our service. So uh, let's uh, close with the prayer. We'll, we'll bring it up, start with that next interesting section, what is love? Uh, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Tex.